Kiora, Kiorana, Talafalava, Malo Alele, Bula, Namaste, G'day, Hello, Hi y'all. I am Tracy Riley, the Secretary for the World Council for Gifted Children, joining you this evening from Aotearoa, New Zealand. It is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Cobus Maria from the University of Pretoria's Department of Educational Psychology. Thank you to the Western Kentucky University College of Education and Behavioral Sciences for sponsoring Professor Maria's keynote, a fitting sponsor for a scholar who holds a Doctor of Education in Career Counseling, a PhD in Learning Facilitation in Mathematics, and a PhD in Psychology. His research interests span a range of important issues for gifted and talented learners worldwide, career counseling, life design, emotional social intelligence, and social responsibility. Professor Maria is an award-winning scholar for his teaching and research and a prolific author of over 100 peer-reviewed articles and over 50 books or book chapters since 2009. In a recent interview, Professor Maria explained that after many years of studying, more than anything, he discovered that his biggest purpose in life was to be there for people who don't have a voice. We are privileged and honoured as a World Council for Gifted and Talented Children to be part of Pro Professor Maria's mission to reach out identify and support those who may be marginalized. If you have any specific questions for Professor Maria, please post those in the chat. And if time allows, he will answer some of those burning questions for you. Please join me in welcoming Professor Maria to the 24th Biennial World Conference and inaugural virtual conference of the World Council. Thank you so much, Tracy, for your lovely introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Allow me to just thank for up first Dr. Tyler Clark for his sterling leadership, enthusiasm, guidance, patience, and support. Also thank Tracy, Nadia, Ms. Erika Solberg, Michael, etc., and in fact, the entire organizing team for their compassionate and outstanding support. You have every reason to feel very proud of yourselves. So, a, bu a bouquet of greetings. Sorry that I couldn't include more gre greeting words on that slide. Just a brief rundown of the presentation overview. We'll focus on a few theoretical aspects first. I'll focus on the context, talk to the changing environment in which we find ourselves. And then I'll talk to the, to the term that you see on the screen, post postmodernizing career counseling, why that is needed. I'll explicate my theoretical framework. Then we'll move on to practical facets. I'll just very briefly focus on 10 research projects on myself so as to help me arrive at 10 key directions before I conclude. So, I love quotes, and so do the, the so do you. I, I guess I'm going to start off by sharing two quotes from Emeritus Archbishop Desmond Tutu, one of our I'm so proud to say no previous Nobel Prize winners. He says we need all the geniuses we can get, and he adds that it's criminal not to want to develop the talent of gifted learners to the highest possible extent. And you know what? I just had to slip in something from Aristotle as well. He says, right there at the intersection of our talents and the needs of the world, there we can find our vocation or our job or our career, if you wish. So let's set the context to this presentation. Very briefly, gifted whenever I use the word gifted, please read gifted and talented. I'm just trying to save a little time. From my perspective, in my experience, and probably, probably yours as well, uh, learners with giftedness and talent are not satisfied to just blossom on their own. Quite the opposite. They want other people to benefit from what they're doing, thrive and blossom as well. Also, just want to quickly uh, clarify, giftedness, from my perspective, 
is seen in exceptional performance and exceptional prowess, and it, of course, it develops over time. And maybe just the following slide, potential, of course, should in the initially guide us in terms of identifying giftedness, but then later on, we look at the actual achievement, and then eminence. Those of you listening today, watching this presentation, you've all gained eminence. So I think this little definition makes sense to you as well, I hope. Something that I've learned over time, and maybe my experience correlates positively with yours, gifted learners don't always take kindly to imposed, perceived, meaningless, generalized structures. They enjoy a sense of freedom. Let's focus briefly on the, uh, the global self context, African context especially. Sadly, heartbreakingly, the terms of the term gifted education has fallen by the wayside. Over here, sad to say, gifted education excludes, especially people, like I said, that they don't really have a voice, like Tracy said in the beginning. People from ethnic minorities, people with poverty, and as Renzulli nicely summarizes it, those that show their potential in non-traditional ways. And then especially Peterson said it many years ago, it fails to differentiate between how I look, who I am, and my potential. Begore and Slavinsky, I love, I love this term, pearls and shells, and Munro agrees and he says that gifted students most of the time will probably attract less attention. Sadly so, because they could be our future Einsteins, Mother Teresa's, Desmond Tutus, if you want to understand giftedness from an African perspective, then you should take into account the following three words that you see on the screen, Ujama, Isinti, Ubuntu, the idea of the collective needs of people. I'm there for you. I'm there for the community. The focus on dignity, humanity, respect for others. In African context, and I think the majority of you know this, the needs of the individual mostly subsumed in the needs of the group because the emphasis is placed on promoting the well-being of the group. Let me share one story with you, something that I always carry with me. I do a lot of work in outlying areas and please go to my website and see what the wonderful people at the Good Work Foundation in Pomalanga in South Africa, Africa do, just a state of the art center. And there I encountered, let's call the person Barista. I tell you what, he probably makes the, makes the nicest cappuccino, coffee, tea, whatever you prefer in the entire world. And I really am dead serious. Now, so in, being so inspired by his story, I wanted to add his story, very inspiring. Um, it, well, it has the makings of a brilliant book. I wanted to add the story to my website so as to promote his career, etc., etc. And then very gently and very kindly, the CEO, Kate, and the staff reminded me that Kubis, this is Ubuntu area. If you single out Barista, he, that might lead to him being ostracized. I took the lesson very, very well. After all, this is Ubuntu Ujama Isenti country. Always, always, maybe, whenever you listen to my presentation, throughout the presentation, take the following into account. I believe that the reticular activating system's role should never be underestimated, simply because it takes what anybody focuses on and creates a filter. So if you drive to work today and you want to see green cars, guess what you're going to see? If you want to see red cars, the very, very same thing. So and this is a message to everybody, including the teachers. If we want to identify something in this case, especially giftedness and talent, guess what? You might very well be successful. So let's very briefly talk to the the shifting, shifting, changing, if you wish, work environment and gifted education. I don't need to talk about this matter. You and I know about inequality that is escalating. You and I know about insecurity in the workplace. And you're probably as aware as I am 
of the two possible future scenarios. The dystopian possibility, I tell you what, many people say the bots will take over our work, etc., etc. I don't know that I believe that. What I do know is I've seen so many gross exaggerations that you know what, I'm, I'm quite dumbstruck when people talk um, about the future and it's doom and gloom everywhere. Other people believe in maybe let's call it robot utopia in the words of Naidu. They believe that no, the bots will take meaningless jobs out of our hands and allow us to focus on doing meaningful things, find a rekindled sense of purpose. I'm inclined, especially after having met, met this cute little robot that helped me um, on my way back from Suhul, sitting there at the Suhul airport, and the robot even insisted that I smile and have a photograph taken of self. So that was just wonderful, strengthened my belief in the robots and their contribution. If, if I look at what's happened in the past, I'm not going to talk too much about this. Workplace transformation has been with us forever. 1800s, 1900s, today, the future, it will always be there. But hey, humankind has always exhibited the inventiveness to deal with these changes. Rapid changes happening today, guess what? We will deal with these changes as we've always done. So all of these changes mean, mean a number of things. And from the perspective of, of this presentation, we need to address the career uh, counseling needs of our clients and especially from the perspective of this presentation we need to probably not only postmodernize but i think we're in the post postmodern era already i couldn't find the, an appropriate word to substitute that lengthy term but we need we need to respond adequately now like you do like others do in their fields of interest oftentimes we take a step back and reflect on what's happened in our field over the past 120, 140, 50 years, etc. I'm going to run you very briefly through the history of career guidance, counseling, vocation over the past 122 years, 120 years. From the beginning of the 1900s to the middle of the previous century, vocational guidance, career advising elsewhere. That was the time when people had to be matched to their environments, the trait and factor theories abounded, and test and tell um, the, main, the main theoretical orientation. But then middle of the previous century, people started focusing on developmental status, mastering the developmental tasks, attitudes, beliefs, and competencies, so the emphasis was on developing these traits. And then, end of the previous century, career construct constructing came to the fore. Deeply respectful, and this is, the, this is especially the approach that I'm going to be talking to today, the notion of designing the self, constructing a career, especially crafting a career identity and helping people find purpose and meaning. This will all make sense to you. If you take into account that we need a different approach, we needed one, because 120 years ago, many thousands of jobs came onto the market and it made sense to develop tests, test people, tell them what to do, fit them to environments, but it's no longer the case. Every day you and I read about jobs disappearing. So let me interrupt myself. I don't even know what the word career, occupation, job, work, peace, work, call it whatever you wish means. In the context in which I work, this is something that the majority, and you hear the word this, this kind of job, work, whatever, is something that is rife. Many people with true talent have no choice but to do what you see on the screen. And let me put something on the table right now. Even then, we need to find a way to help them make sense, make sense, make meaning, and create a sense of purpose for themselves in their careers. That is a very key point in the presentation. 
So we dare not prepare the gifted using an out-of-date approach for a world that might no longer exist in a, in a year or so, or that is already no longer in existence. You know as well as I do that work environments no longer hold us like it did many years ago. We need to draw on our own autobiographies to hold ourselves. Here's an example that you might find interesting. At a, at a, during a project at a school in a township, the chappy, very bright young man says to me, you tell me why I should study or work hard. You know what, people are losing their jobs on a daily basis. So many people are without employment. They've got the most beautiful girls, the beautiful houses. And he says, no, come on, you convince me. Why should I work for USD 348 per month when I can make 68 USD per day doing crime? Now, I'm saying this and my heart sinks. What the person says from his perspective makes sense. Something that we really need to think about hard and long and deep. So we're adopting, my team and I, following the cue uh, from Mark Zivikas, a qualitative plus quantitative approach. In other words, yes, we still believe in testing the gift, testing other people. And you see, we are aware of which test I'm referring to. But, and I think the game-changing slide is the following one. Mark Zivikas said this in 1993 already. He says, what exists for individuals today are not positions on a normal curve. Instead, it's purpose. And I couldn't agree more. Therefore, yes, it's wonderful to elicit people's scores. But we also need to focus on their stories. Stories, meaning, responses to open-ended questions such as, who were or are your role models? What hurt you most when you were young? Simply because responses to these questions helps us uncover key life themes. And I'll explain that term more, more um, fully in a moment. The approach then is premised on the idea of not being interested in how you differ from others or I differ from you. That's immaterial. The only thing we're interested in is in you as an individual, on your individual stories. There are some individual stories that I wish I had the time to talk to. People that came from terribly disadvantaged context and made it um, in life and continue to do so much good in this world. How about the following story? When I, when I met the person in, in a rural school, he was very depressed. The, the headmaster said to me, Prof, would you please take care of this, this little chappy? He seems to have lost his, his, his passion, his enthusiasm. This is what he wrote. That's the, the heading of my life story, and that's, those are the headings of the different chapters. Turns out he was sold by his parents at a very young age. And knowing that was catching up with him. Today, after intervention, he is a brilliant student studying engineering. And guess what? He's going to become our next Nelson Mandela. So these stories shed so much light on his situation. And I'm often criticized when I talk to the following two slides. I believe that whatever approach we use should work on an individual level, yes. Private school, New York. Public school, Zanzibar. Correctional services facility, Mexico. But it should also work on a collective level. Affluent suburb, youthful slum dwellers, homeless learners. It should work everywhere. And I stand or fall by that. And you know what? I'm the first to agree. It's a long and winding road. But I'm not going to budge any day soon. So not onto the theoretical framework like I promised. Number one, I don't think anybody should pledge allegiance to a theory only. The only thing that matters is in, this, in a theory that will help you best describe your gifted little client and intervening on her or his behalf. So my theoretical framework is career construction theory, 
Mark Sivakis's genius approach, meta theory that takes into account the differential developmental and the dynamic approaches. And like I said very briefly, discovering traits, adapting, developing these traits, and most of all, uncovering people's career life themes. Simply because I agree with Oliver Sacks that we all we all have a life story and an inner narrative. And that's what I'm focusing on today. So what is career construction counseling about very briefly? We help people narrate, recount their stories. We help them draw on these autobiographies with proven plans of action during transitions. We help them become adaptable, employable, and we help them to not only intend to do things, we help them to actually become active. We need to see action and change. In the end, we help them clarify these existential questions. Who am I? Why do I live? Why do I work? Where am I, am I headed? And colleagues, these are the questions that our youngsters are really interested in. I don't underestimate them ever. The glue that holds our stories together is our career life identity. And that is why the strong emphasis on the career life identity. Now, very briefly about adaptability, which is huge these days, as you know and I know. I think adaptability also means that we should focus on proficiencies that are not easily replaceable by AI and the robots, and all the C's that you see on the screen. So collaboration, critical thinking, creativity, imagination, emotional social intelligence, please note, compassion, all the hard skills. I agree with Wolf that we should no longer re refer to these, these uh, abstract concepts as soft skills. These are actually the post postmodern hard skills. How about that? little slide. Now forget about the language, that's immaterial. These two young men found a way in the middle of nowhere to convert this vehicle into a business. Now you know what, from my perspective, this is a timeless photograph. So the rationale before I get to practical, to the practical side, very little research has been done in global South contexts on the approach that I'm talking to. In Global North context, the career construction interview marks it because it's a genius uh, um, uh, intervention or questionnaire, if you wish, is the most written about questionnaire in our history. But in group contexts, both in the Global North and in the Global South, we desperately need more research. So, as I've promised, on to the practical side of matters. I believe that practice precedes theory, theory feeds back into practice, and the cycle goes on and on and on. So there are two research questions guiding the presentation, my research forever, would be, how can we elicit gifted learners as stories and scores in group and individual contexts and help them help them clarify their career life identity. So this is what our research is about. I've got permission from the chappie to show his face. I always take photographs, have their stuff and their cell phone number to my website. So if you go to my website, please help the young people and order their stuff. They're doing a brilliant job and they really need our support. So briefly something about the research context. I'm gonna talk to 10 projects, some of them specifically aimed at people with giftedness and talent, some of them including people with giftedness and talent. Now, this is a timeless slide. Those of you that have not been to South Africa, please come here the moment COVID allows, and it should probably be soon. This photograph taken on the top of the mountain at the end of my last um, research project in conjunction with the SA. Career Development Association, very close to the spot, top of the mountain where former president of Mozambique, Samora Machel's plane fell. Desperately poor environment. But 
Seeing youngsters there that have nothing, display their creativity. Seeing people there that have lost their will to live and trying to make a difference will always lure me back. I, I urge you, please buy yourself a flight ticket, go there, and you will see something timeless that will inspire you as much as it inspires me. Many of my participants caught in, in the words of Canham and Langer in the intersection of multiple oppressions. So, you know what? Probably in my, from the way I see it, in an intersectionality interface, I'm, I'm mostly lost. There are some of the contexts in which I work. There you see people from seven nations working together at the Good Work Foundation. What's that beautiful tree? Isn't that just marvelous? So now on to then research methodology. Many of you probably also use this kind of approach. So let's get practical. In these COVID times, you visit your doctor and she says, I need stories. She asks herself, how does the patient look? What part of the body is affected most? But she also needs scores, blood pressure, blood tests, etc. So based on the data, she plans her intervention and it's executed. After the intervention, there's a post-assessment and data construction. She says, how are you feeling now as opposed to pre? So what we're doing is something that has been in existence forever. There on this slide, you see a brief summary of what I've just spoken to. Something that happens in real life every day. We work qualitatively, note the uppercase, the preference given by the majority of us working in the field of career construction. We also work quantitatively. We deal with stories, we deal with scores, and we elicit subconscious insights as well as conscious knowledge individually but also in groups. The goals of this approach are very clear and the outcomes highly measurable. I agree with Mark because that says you don't need to meet my approach. He says, find something that will help you listen for valid stories, not veracity. So there you have a replica of the career construction interview. You can see the open-ended questions. You can also see that first question that I'm going to be talking to now. Now, How about the question about role models? Mother Teresa, one of my all-time role models, everything she aspired to is something that I aspire to about. Well. So when we choose our role models, when the gifted learner talks to his role models or her role models. He's actually talking to somebody that faced a challenge similar to the ones he faced or, us, or she faced or is still facing. And he also looks at their resolution and probably bases her or his resolution to his or her idiosyncratic challenge on the resolution, in this case, Mother Teresa found to resolve her challenge. I therefore designed in the over 30 years, the career interest profile. It's a, the name is a total misnomer. I elicit people's stories and scores and the refrain is clear by now. It's an intervention as well that helped people rekindle their sense of meaning, purpose, hope and positivity. There you see a brief summary of the, of the questionnaire now, just want to highlight the following. I still elicit traits. It has a small quantitative component, but I also talk to the developmental status, maybe the, the unmastered developmental tasks, and everything revolves around their life themes, the career identity, and the sense of purpose. Briefly, something about the, the theoretical framework of the, of the instrument. I've added self-concept in psychosocial development theories, but also trauma theory, simply because many of us, if not the majority of us, all of us, have unresolved traumatic experiences and unmastered developmental tasks. Now, you know that these tasks recur regularly during our lives. And if we repeat these things, you hear, often hear people say, you know what, this always happens to me. I'm always being bullied. 
I'm always being, I'm always late. I'm always being isolated. If we repeat without mastery, that is pathological. If we repeat with mastery, that is healing, because it promotes adaptability and growth, etc. And Freud said this much many years ago already. I also designed a, a, a test that sits on our board's list. There you see a brief copy of that thing. All of this to say, we didn't, don't exclude anything, why would we? And from a mode of administration perspective, everything that I try to do is available in the in-person, hybrid, blended, and online format, because we need to reach out to people in the furthest corners of South Africa, in Africa, and we work synchronously as well as asynchronously. Now, let's see if the plan can come together now. So we need to link the qual and the quant outcomes in the end. Here's an example of what we want every gifted learner to walk away with after an intervention. Clarification, linking the career choice, let's say lawyer, with the personal meaning, the vision, I believe personal meaning should be referred to as the, as the mission. For instance, I want to defend people, use my talent to debate, demonstrate my ability to remain calm, and in the end, everything revolves around the social media, making a social contribution. That's the vision statement. For instance, helping bullied people stand up for themselves. And here already you see shades of Sternberg's notion of promoting the common good. Many other people, have to, have to, scholars have talked to this matter as well. Of course, in the end, we want to see action and we want to see forward movement, movement and change. And in the words of Mark Vickers and many others, we need to enable people to actively master what they've experienced passively. Now you'll see also why career counseling is a th regarded as a therapeutic endeavor. The differentiation between counseling and therapy, I think that's an artificial distinction that no longer has a place. And of course, all the time we need to convert our challenges into solutions and always social contributions. Here are two examples. A young girl is bitten in the face by a pit bull terrier when she was five years old. The animal tears off um, the left cheek skin, cheek skin almost completely, and she's taken to a plastic surgeon to be stitched back. So what's she studying? What is she studying today? Studying to become a medical doctor because she wants to specialize in plastic surgery, mastering what she's had to endure passive, passively. Another example, come on, let's let's just be honest. When the young youngsters come to me, especially the males, and say to me, I want to make a lot of money, um, we're hearing, I feel insecure. And we often try to gently nudge them towards rather try to make a social contribution, follow your passion, and you will make money. But it's everybody's right to make money. So we need to help people convert their pain or their hurt into a business model. Here's one example. Woman that I, that I encountered many years ago when she fell pregnant, grade nine, she now travels extensively after having studied to become a social worker, and she addresses learners, females especially, on things related to teenage pregnancy, turning her pain into a social contribution, but also a business model. Miss Dolly Parton, that I hold in the highest esteem, Miss Parton, in addition to all the other wonderful, wonderful things she does and has done, her father couldn't read or write, so what, she, what is she doing today? Distributing free books to the tune of 150 million books already across the world. Active mastery of what she has had to endure passively. So let's focus, like I promised, on 10 key directions in contextualized counseling for career construction. Please note the word contextualized. Number one, when a client comes to us, watch, listen, observe. The first thing, what is the person hoping to gain from the intervention colleagues? If we listen carefully, if we observe carefully, and we ask the following question, Mark Sivikas asks 
how can I be useful to you? I've tweaked that question a little because I've learned during my research that the word useful is often curiously misconstrued. Ask whatever you wish. It's very important to elicit the story because when people explain to us what it is that they need, what this so-called problem, I prefer the word challenge is, they also reveal the plan they have to resolve the, 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 the issue or the matter. And if we ask a number of questions, they will offer us the solution. We don't need to advise them. We just need to listen for, instead of to their stories, with the words of royalty. And number one feeds into number two. Deal with power dynamics, power issues all the time. The approach that we're activating allows people to remain in control all the time. They choose which micro stories they wish to share with us. For instance, the question about the role models. And they propose their own interpretations. They are the experts on their own lived experiences, not us. And we need, need to in, include their voices into any planning and action. And you've heard this now repeatedly during the presentation. Dispense all the information you wish, but forever remain aloof when it comes to advising people. Don't advise ever because true advice comes from within. Yes, in the words of Mark Sebekus, become the editor of your learners' stories, but help them co-construct Build them on their intuitive solutions. Don't try to interpret on their behalf. The counselee, please note, should not be told what to do. Should not be told that there is a right or a wrong career. There are only careers that are appropriate, more or less appropriate. So don't ever let the counselee leave your consulting room feeling that she has been in the presence of this powerful expert that told her or him what to do. So we integrate the stories, the conscious knowledge with our subconscious insights. Briefly about the matter, eliciting conscious knowledge, that's, that's very straightforward. We administer vocational guidance, we assess people, we, we obtain uh, just what their traits are, et cetera, their developmental status, but tapping into the subconscious from my perspective, remains in the domain of registered psychologists. Earliest recollections question yields super answers, but only in the hands of a highly skilled person. Likewise, if you ask a question about, for instance, hurtful things, I would suggest that only psychologists ask those two specific questions. I just had to say something about Milton Erickson, the very famous founder of the Ericksonian hypnotherapy movement. Could not agree more. He says, get your gifted learner any way you wish, any way you can to do things. And please, when you deal with gifted learners, as you're doing, I'm absolutely sure, already contextualize at all levels. So de, re, co-contextualize and be humble. Humble humility will take you very far. You're all humble people, people with giftedness, can I, can I say it, I very rarely encounter people with true giftedness and talent that aren't humble because they understand so much. So please abandon all preconceived assumptions, like I did in the case of Barista. Always ask the experts, the local people, to clarify. Here's an example that I encountered in my private practice a few weeks ago. The question that I often ask is, what do or did your parents advise you to study? The chappie says, my dad wants me to become a grower in the weed industry. And I'll tell you what, 50 years ago, had I received this kind of response, I would have responded differently because the weed industry was still forbidden over here. So I'm heading towards the finishing line. Develop people's grit. You might find this very trite, but courage, conscientiousness, confidence, creativity, commitment, resilience, our gifted learners need to be, need the reaffirmation that it's good to develop enhanced grit, that people with grit get on in life, do great things. 
And the eighth of my key dire directions, of course, we're dealing with very bright people. So let's promote their abstractivization acumen. Help them identify patterns, of course, but please not only one, two, four, seven, eleven, what's the next number? We also need to help them identify qualitative patterns qualitatively. Let them take these concepts to a different level by reformulating. Here are a few things. person says, I was bullied. I was always regarded as different. I was always lonely. I was never good enough. I stutter, I stammer, I chew my finger nails. nails. Here you have themes, probably unmastered developmental tasks, unresolved issues that need to be resolved. Let me just, almost, almost done, share two vision and mission statements with you. If you look at learners' responses to this specific exercise, you have a marvelous way of gathering information about their verbal prowess. Look at the following two, following two sets of uh, mission and vision statements. Woman says, I'm going to study a degree in dramatic arts. She says, everybody discouraged me from going into the field of dramatic arts. Uh, you know that the, 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 the famous repetition, you won't have a job. Over here, that kind of thing is right. She says, I want to now fulfill my dream, my deep sense of appreciation for performing arts, entertaining audiences, actualizing my God-given talent. And she says, isn't this just excruciatingly beautiful? She says, if I want to inspire people with traumatic experiences. Now already she puts her cards on the table. She says, I want to heal, want to teach them how to write books write songs, express their pain, add joy to their lives. And she concludes by saying, and I don't want to insult or hurt anyone. And this chap, he says, I'm going to become a chemical engineer. I want to specialize in renewable energy. Look how nicely he talks to his personal meaning. I want to meet my need to be creative, analytic, etc., etc. And in the process, he says, I want people to become less dependent on fossil fuels, make this world a healthier place, etc. And he says, and again, look how he puts his cards on the table. I grew up in a township where air pollution, and if you come to our shores outside of Johannesburg, for instance, you'll see what he's talking about, where it is a major, major chance. The tenth and the last point, and here, here I'm quoting, quoting Lifton, already something said in 1979, he says, we need to promote people's sense of symbolic immortality. And my language editor says, the term doesn't make sense to him, but he'll ac accept it given that it comes from Lifton. So what are gifted learners on about? What are you and I on about? Feeling that we're constructing a worthwhile work-related legacy. And colleagues, whether people want to know it or not, it makes us feel good to know that we're doing something for somebody, that we're making a social contribution. So in conclusion, this approach lies at the heart of counseling for career construction. And I believe firmly that five years down the line, we will probably talk to life purpose counseling. And I agree with Monroe that says, it all goes to show how much gifted students intuitively already benefit from being asked open-ended questions. So do I believe that all people can be successful, can choose to be purposely, can purposely choose to be happy and successful? Yes, I do, but this is something that my team and I regularly encounter. Young women raped by a gang, dropped by the police people at an orphanage. So, the message is a caveat with the necessary support structures and mechanisms. Anybody, anywhere can be helped to convert challenges into opportunities and social contributions and can be helped to create their fire. Isn't this just beautiful? One of the Junior Taki projects and believingly wear this kind of t shirt. The anonymous feedback from a 19-year-old inmate 
after a SADDA SA career development intervention a year ago at a correctional services facility. At the end, the guy says, I'll, I'll find a job, maybe plumber, maybe poultry farmer, establish my own business, make money. And he says so beautifully, I'll use my story to inspire others and contribute to their well-being. And in the words of Father Boyd, this observation also speaks to the ultimate aim that I've been talking about at length now. It helps to heal others, restore, and back their sense of purpose, meaning, self-respect. And guess what? In the end, they heal us. So in healing others, they heal us and they restore and they hand back our own sense of dignity. Last three slides. And you, you probably heard me sigh. Humble very recently says, in the slums of Dar es Salaam, and you can substitute Pretoria, Johannesburg, Delhi, New York, Paris, Rotterdam, Florence, doesn't matter where you go. There are so many children of high ability, undiscovered, people that have no one that believes who they are. Children that will probably never know what they can achieve. So just a little message, a little plea. Every gifted learner needs at least one person. You, me, somebody that genuinely, show, genuinely shows care, love, and appreciation. So my last slide. In the words of my very dear friend, Professor Ruben Baron, that asks, how many gifted learners has the world lost? Is it still losing on a daily basis? Mother Teresa's, Albert Einstein's, Nelson Mandela's, Marx Evicus's, and there you can add all the names you wish, other, or other luminaries that might have made substantial contributions to humankind. I conclude by thanking Prof. Marx Evicus, my ultimate role model and friend. I'm indebted to you, and I think the whole world actually is. And whatever I'm doing, I'm doing to honor the legacy of my beloved mother, and I thank everybody profoundly for your patience and for having sat through this lengthy presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kobus. Um, I was so struck by a number of things that you said, but um, one in particular was about finding your fire. Um, I like that idea of finding finding passion and what excites you. And I really appreciate the deep knowledge of career counselling that you've shared with us today. I don't think that this is a topic in my time attending our conferences that we've really explored. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think you also reminded us um, that what matters most to people is having a purpose. It's not our position on that normal curve or even the abnormal curve. So thank you very much. We do have a few questions that have come in as you were speaking. So I'm going to, um, to ask you a few of those. One was, how can we help a multi-potentiality um, gifted student to plan their future career? So when we have gifted students with multiple talents and abilities. Thank you very much, Tracy, and thank you for that question. Um, at least we are given 70 odd years and then some more and some of us grow 100 and you and I, Tracy, will probably exceed 100 one day. I agree that there's so much to do, but I'm actually hearing there's so much that I want to do. I want to make a huge contribution. And my gist is ask somebody maybe to help you listen to yourself. So if you were asking for advice, um, the, the person that asked the question, I cannot give you advice, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm willing to listen to your story and allow you to listen to yourself. What I'm hearing, like I said, is the words spoken by a very dedicated person that says, life is so short. But you know what? Life is also so long. We have many, many years. Let's start something. Let's get some platform from which we develop further and further and further and take things one step at a time. And like we help people, the starfish principle, start with one person, 
one little project, it becomes two, becomes four, that becomes eight, 16, etc. That's the best answer I can offer in the time available. Thank you. That's a brilliant answer. Thank you. We've got to start somewhere. I agree with you on that. Um, do you have a typical age group that you've designed your um, assessment for? Thank you so much. Um, the, the, the CIP works with people from age 2 to age 100. That's predominantly a qualitative questionnaire. We can tweak it, contextualize it, we can work together. And I sincerely hope we can work together um, Tracy, maybe you and I, maybe others and I, I'd love to learn from you. I'd love to, to see what I can do to improve what I'm doing. And I'd love to learn. I travel extensively. I have traveled. Not, it's so good to learn from people. So adapt these questionnaires, contextualize them rather in a way that you think fit. But the, the, the qualitative questionnaire you can use at any age with due contextualization. And if you, you've got my email address, and if anybody wants to get in touch with me, you're most welcome. I'll support you as much as, as, much as I want you to support me as well. Please, let's join hands and work together. Thank you. Thank you for that invitation. And, and I'm sure that some of our um, members will certainly take you up on that, Cobus. Um, another question that's come through was regarding gender differences. Um, have you noticed any gender differences in terms of what's needed to support um, particularly gifted students in their career development? Tracy, how much time do we have? Do we have six weeks? <laughs> um, yes, six are... minutes. <laughs> Thanks very much for that. I'm so glad that question um, has been raised. Yes, um, we need to look, look at different contexts again. In different contexts, counseling that, that learners, for instance, receive from their parents are often gender-based. Over here in Africa, whether we like it or not, sadly, the roles and the, 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 the positions of women and the career choices of women in many areas are still limited. When I get to the Good Work Foundation or Mbangwani, wherever, women, it breaks my heart, come there often without ever having been allowed to express themselves properly. Many of them would say to me, that I never knew that engineering would be a possibility or plumbing. Many people say, I've been told what to do. I'm still the woman of my husband and that is my job. Um, that to me is, is, is really saddening. Whether we want to know it or not, I'm going to say something that might end me up in hot water. Only a small percentage of women in this country are allowed to express themselves freely and choose and tell us what it is that they want to do. When I in intervene and do the career adaptability questionnaire pre and post, you will always, almost, almost every single project use the following kind of, of, of outcome. After the intervention, women feel much more curious, but they still say to me, when I go back go back home, go back to my shack tonight. I'm still not in control. So yes, I'm, I'm not afraid to say I'm all in favor of addressing the needs of the women now. Yes, as much as we still address the needs of males, but I think it's time now, especially in the context where I come from, to focus on the needs of women especially. Thank you. I'm just going to ask you one more question. Um, we have a question from Madeleine here in New Zealand, and she is reminding us that in our country, there's a big push around the idea that um, jobs of the future haven't been invented yet. Um, and we're just wondering how this idea, whether we agree with it or not, um, sits and fits within your framework in the work that you've done. Thank you, Tracy. Like I said, um, I've, I've, you've heard that, you've read that, that notion repeatedly. And there's that saying that 66% of grade 12s will end up in a job that no longer exists. I think people really need to be a little more careful. Uh, just, be, I want people to Google, for instance, the saying that um, the job of chartered accountant will disappear. 
That's completely not true. The, the, the advent of artificial intelligence and the robots has given huge impetus to the creation of more jobs in that field, for instance. So yes, new jobs arrive on the scene all the time, but many jobs, and let me put all the listeners' mind at ease, people in the kind of position that you and I find ourselves also, the opportunity, the, the chances of us losing our jobs are probably in the region of 0,1%. So yes, the future is upon us, but no, the future of work is not all gloom and doom. Not all jobs will disappear. And much of what we're talking about today will evolve over time, but in a, in a manner that will be digestible and that will lead to us achieving, attaining a higher sense of purpose, a higher sense of meaning, and be, there will still be employment. Just read up on the matter. I'm not into the alarmistic kind of mode, not by any stretch. Thank you. Thank you, Kobus. And um, as you were speaking early on in your presentation, you talked about the African concept of giftedness and the focus on the collective needs of the people. And that's very similar to our Indigenous Māori concepts here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Um, so thank you for sharing with us today your ideas about how to support those groups of gifted learners, not simply the individuals, and to develop their career identities. I wanted to share with you um, in closing a project Proverb from the Māori culture. Um, he aha te mea nui, o te ao, he tongata, he tongata, he tongata. And the meaning of that proverb translates loosely as what is the most important thing in the world? It is the people, the people, the people. So thank you, Cobus, for sharing with us today your people and sharing with us your deep knowledge and experience in career counselling and, and applying that to gifted learners for us. And I'd like to thank everyone who's with us and joined us today for day one um, of the 2021 conference. Um, please be sure to complete the live session evaluation. Um, make sure that you keep making new contacts with people and connecting with your friends online. Um, day two begins tomorrow um, on the 1st of August at 10 a.m. British Standard Time. And we look forward to seeing everyone online um, for Anouk Box keynote on improving education for gifted learners by bridging the gap between theory and practice. I think there might be a closing slide, but um, I think I'll call it the end of a great first day of the World Council. Thank you so much, Cobus. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you for the fantastic work you're doing. I love that quote. I'm going to Google it and add it to my next presentation. Have a Perfect. beautiful day further. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Kia ora. Goodbye, everybody.